Good morning. Um, so, today's lecture is New Hollywood Cinema or the American New Wave. See, you may recall that we have been trying to capture the essence of all major film movements historically speaking and then we are not only looking at the history of uh, national cinemas, but we are also looking at the various uh, um, newer trends that occurred and uh, to some extent I would also like to capture the contemporary trends in uh, each major uh, cinematic tradition. So, here we continue in the same uh, vein. Uh, so, we have been talking about as you remember the studio years of Hollywood and you remember the kinds of actors and producers and directors that existed during the great era the golden age of uh, Hollywood period. We know that how films were produced and directed and written till the early 60s. Okay. Though the high point of the period is understood as from the 1930s to 19, uh, late 40s. We also know that uh, with the sinking of very big budget films such as Cleopatra, several major studios collapsed paving the way for the so called new Hollywood. It is not as simple, there were several other factors also at play here, but this was one of the major reasons. One was the uh, monumental debacle of Cleopatra. Now, you, you might recall that Cleopatra is starring uh, Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton and Rex Harrison. It was filmed extensively in Rome and uh, uh, the movie had undergone several changes of cast and the directors of, uh, earlier. There was a period when they had attempted to film it uh, in England also, but then because of Elizabeth Taylor's illness they had to uh, redraw the entire schedule and eventually the film was shot in Rome. Uh, this was also a period when uh, star salaries skyrocketed and so did star tantrum. So, this was also uh, the time when Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton started seeing each other and uh, naturally because of too much of media attention on them, the movie suffered. You see, uh, whenever there is an unwanted kind of media attention on any project, it is not the art that uh, matters any longer, but it is the gimmickry, okay. it is the scandal part that was more uh, projected. So, the movie uh, when it was released, it was uh, horribly over budgeted, it had uh, and of course, uh, Elizabeth Taylor's uh, uh, salary and uh, her uh, the kind of uh, the amount of money they had spent on her costumes and even on her retinue. Okay, she would travel big, she was a huge star and she would travel with an entire uh, army of her supporters and her assistants and all that cost studios a major, major uh, amount of money. Now, um, and the sad part of it is that the movie tanked very badly commercially as well as critically. This was also followed by another big budget film uh, that is Dr. Doolittle starring Rex Harrison and this was about a doctor. This is based on a children's uh, story, you know, a series of stories uh, capturing the uh, or delineating the adventures of this uh, nice doctor who talks to animals who can understand their language and this film also flopped very badly. It was a musical. Now, uh, two back to back debacles and all uh, already there were um, other social changes or the cultural changes that were and the major one was the uh, massive attention focused on television. Now, television that is the small box or a small screen had entered the American uh, in a house in a very big way. So, people would rather spend their time uh, watching television with in the comfort of their homes rather than go out and watch films in the uh, movie theatre. All this led to uh, a major 
a very big kind of a uh, rethinking that the studios resorted to. Now, 20th century Fox had already collapsed under the weight of Cleopatra and uh, at the same time they were also suffering uh, some very serious issues concerning Marilyn Monroe who was uh, filming another movie with them uh, on the 20th century studio lots in Hollywood. So, she would not turn up for the shooting and she would not uh, give them the required dates. She was, she was also extremely ill and then her untimely death. So, all this led to kind of you know uh, revisiting the old Hollywood system that uh, studios were no longer very sure if big budget films starring very big actors you know the so called box office draws if that was enough to pull the audience back in the movie theatre. And this was a time when they wanted to start uh, very critically start analyzing their structure. Before I go into uh, the depths of the new Hollywood system, let me also tell you the cultural background of that period. Now, there is a term called counterculture, many of you are I am very sure familiar with it, especially students of uh, literature or also those who are interested in uh, culture studies. So, counterculture is a subculture that opposes, challenges and rejects significant elements of the prevalent or dominant culture of any period, usually that which is in line with accepted norms and conditions. Counterculture aims to give voice to the ethos aspirations of a specific population during a specific time period. In America, this was the late 50s, the early 60s and also the early 70s. So, the 60s, um, the late 50s, the 60s and the early 70s is broadly understood as the counterculture period. It is often dubbed as dropping out of the mainstream that is you no, you no longer want to or wish to belong to the mainstream or the majority. Counterculture movements are in opposition to one or more aspects of prevalent social norms and cultural excesses. A seminal period of this and this is one of the earliest films, I am not calling it seminal because it was one of the earliest movies that gave voice to the marginalized, to the anti-establishment group, especially the younger people to the youth of American society and this movie was The Wild One starring Marlon Brando. And this was a trendsetter for the so called biker films and introduced the drifter and the alienated hero in cinema. It was also the first film to glamorize the antisocial and maladjusted and also anti authoritarian youth to cinema in cinema. Uh, one of the most memorable lines that Marilyn Brando utters in this film is all the Beatles have missed you and Beatles is for girls. This is a, a line that was uh, uh, that inspired the group, the famous British rock group Beatles to uh, for naming their group. Now, New Hollywood as I have been talking about is often seen at the time between the late 60s and the mid 70s. Now, you have to remember that uh, Cleopatra was released in the early 60s and from that time onwards uh, studios started rethinking their strategies, how to make films, how to produce films and how to um, uh, rather than uh, making films as a star vehicles, they had to be there had to be something more. And where did they look at and who did they look at it? They looked towards the French new wave. Now, when I was telling you um, about uh, the French new wave cinema in one of my earlier classes, I told you how uh, what a strong influence it was on the American new wave. So, this is what we are going to talk about today. Now, um, this is a period from mid 60s and the early 70s as mid 70s also, when directors and screenwriters exercised greater control over the film rather than stars and studios. So, the collapse of studios in the uh, yeah, so now I am going to tell you how the shift 
took place during this period. Now, uh, one of the uh, most apart from cultural uh, that is the counterculture movement, we are also talking about the formation of this is a very important period uh, uh, moment in American cultural history. Um, it is we are talking about the 50s and the formation of Hell's Angels Motorcycle Club, uh, which was formed in San Francisco organized initially by someone called Rocky Graves. The members of the club were free spirited uh, men bound by brotherhood and loyalty towards each other. They would often bike or gun their bikes down um, uh, in the areas around Sunset Boulevard and this gave birth to a new way of life. Now, a cultural revolution was on its way also with the music and the uh, and other artists of the period. For example, Bob Dylan, The Doors, Rolling Stone and Andy Warhol, they all pioneered the change. It was also a period of psychedelic art, rock music and the so called hippie movement. William Burroughs, the writer of Junkie 1953 was one of the earliest authors of uh, literature of protest and anti-establishment and it came on the heels of Catcher in the Rye which is truly a seminal event in American cultural history, literary history that is by Selinger in 1951. The manifesto for the cultural revolution of the period was uh, explicit, uh, explicitly uh, laid down by Allen Ginsberg in 1956 in his book in his work Howl, the poem Howl, where um, Ginsberg declared, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked. Howl was a protest against the tyrannical tendencies of post-war America and its commercialism and also its intolerance towards a newer ethos, a newer kind of voice. Another major event was the publication of On the Road by Jack Kerouac in 1957, which maps the journey across America by Sal Paradis and Dean Moriarty in 1947. These works set the tones for new themes that is freedom from the cultural stasis, expression of individualism and self and also uh, very interestingly, they be, be, uh, bemoan the uh, decline or loss of American masculinity. So, therefore, perhaps this uh, stress on using uh, uh, bikes, you know bikes after all and especially symbolized by Harley Davidson kinds of bikes, they were uh, symbolic of the ultimate in masculinity. Now. Um, European art house cinema was also another major influence on the growth of American new wave cinema. Uh, we have already seen what was Italian new realism and French new wave cinema. Uh, this was also a time when the great Antonini, his movie La Ventura became a sensation at Cannes festival and its depiction of the rich and bold had a lasting impression on the cinematic consciousness. In England, Antonini's Blow Up, which was a 1966 movie, offered a mystery without a solution, so cinema became more open ended and even suggests that uh, if uh, there was a, even a mystery to begin with, so the entire scene might have taken inside the head of the hero who is very interestingly, ironically a photographer. So, more than anything else the film blow up, it uh, portrayed the sense of alienation in the swinging 60s. Swinging 60s is the um, nomenclature given to uh, the London life during the 60s. So, both La Ventura and blow up, they decline any kind of closure, they do not do not explain events to the spectators and it is the ambiguity that captured the uh, time, the zitgist of, of that period. Now, uh, politically this was a time of anti-war feelings for the Vietnam War. A students protests in 1968 uh, was a major highlight, a 1968 democratic convention in Chicago 
the assassination of President John Kennedy and also later his brother Senator Robert Kennedy. This was followed by another bloody uh, event, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. These were the events that had uh, far reaching influence on the American consciousness. Socioculturally, the defining event that marked the start of the gay rights movement was the Stonewall riot which was a series of violent demonstrations against a police raid that took place at the Stonewall Inn which was a gay bar. This was the first instance of this kind in American history. Now, um, another important uh, term that you should know is the term Woodstock and Woodstock Nation it was coined by Abby Hoffman. Um, and uh, according to the cultural scholar Bruce Schulman, the counterculture relied on music as a means of communication, a, communi uh, a communal ritual, a gathering of the tribes. Among the major representatives of this movement are Jimi Hendrix, Bob Dylan, The Who and The Beatles. Now, 1969 is taken as the year of Woodstock, a musical festival where 32 musical acts were performed in front of uh, 500,000 concert goers and it generated solidarity, a kind of loyalty and brotherhood among the like minded people over various social political issues. Uh, technically also this was an interesting era, new Hollywood films got an impetus from the practitioners of cinema verite such as Richard Leacock and D. A. Penbaker and also the Maisel brothers, M A Y S L E brothers, who developed cheap live, lightweight equipment and enabled the filmmakers to take to streets to capture the city life, the reality of life. We have been talking about, if you remember, the British New Wave cinema and I have already introduced you to these names. So, again I am repeating this in order to understand their importance in developing the new Hollywood kind of cinema, which owed a lot to the development of new and lightweight equipments. So, uh, it uh, sort of liberated the filmmakers to come out from the shackles of the studios, the heavy equipment, to jettison the heavy equipment and come out on the streets and capture the real life, the city life, the street life. In the mid 60s, US theatre attendance was declining and we have already talked about bloated epics, mindless musicals and they all these started flopping. Now, aided by the new equipment, filmmakers now were free to make a small budget and more personal films which soon found acceptance among the audience. So, that is the background of the entire new Hollywood period. One of the earliest films of this pe uh, period is Bonnie and Clyde. So, this was a 1967 uh, film, Bonnie and Clyde along with The Graduate. Now, these two films sent shock waves through the film industry. The films are about the rebellious youth and they hi um, highlighted the prevalent uh, mood of anti-establishment and anti-authoritarianism. It uh, paved way for the cinema of anarchy, finally. Bonnie and Clyde was uh, a shock to the system and the director Arthur Penn explained that we are in the Vietnam war, this film cannot be sanitized and is still violent. So, the sanitized and the immaculate kind of film were over, the period was finally over. I have already talked about Arthur Penn and you can consider Arthur Penn as one of the earliest and one of the most rebellious kind of a filmmaker of this period. Now, uh, he is the one who led the way at least for the first wave of new Hollywood. Now, a key feature of this period was that the directors started assuming the mantle of the artist just like they did, just the way they did in the French new wave period. And directors started developing personal styles distinct from that of other directors. Uh, it was also a time when the directors enjoyed as much power, prestige and also material success 
uh, which was till then only accorded to the stars and the studios. So, the direct, uh, director became the key person to go to. This is also a time when uh, new voices emerged, new filmmakers and actors arrived on the scene and some of them are Warren Beatty, the actor. He is also a major producer, he invested a lot in Bonnie and Clyde, um, a major risk taker of his times. Peter Bogdanovich, Francis Ford Coppola, Dennis Hopper, Peter Fonda, John Cassavetes, Arthur Penn, Mike Nichols. In England, you have Mike Nick, uh, Lee also, Mike Nichols too, Hal Ashby, Robert Altman and Stanley Kubrick are some of the most significant names of the first wave of New Hollywood period. Now, coming back to Bonnie and Clyde, the legend of Bonnie and Clyde is well documented in American culture. This is a, a story based on, a sto uh, based on the real life bank robbers Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow. Now, there were two journalists, Robert Benton and David Newman. They wrote majorly for the Esquire magazine and they came up with their version of the legend. Now, Warren Beatty, who was uh, um, already uh, an established actor, though not a superstar at that time, he got interested enough to produce the film along with the backing of the Warner Brothers, the studio. The film was intended to be a low budget film to be directed by Arthur Penn and scripted by Robert Town. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde pulled out all stops when it came to taking risks. To begin with, the majority of actors were from New York okay, and not those trained in studios, but trained in acting schools of New York. The violence was a shocker. It was very much true to life and real life. It was like almost blasting holes on the screen. Anti-establishment to its heart, it brazenly romanticizes the outlaws who are actually robbers and killers. The film was initially trashed by old fashioned critics such as Bosley Crother, who uh, wrote for New York Times. But Another major critic that was fast emerging on the scene, Pauline Keel, she helped revive the prospects of this film. She wrote extensively about the merits of the film and soon Pauline Keel became, uh, came at the center or at the forefront of American film criticism. Okay, her voice uh, held a ma major influence on what people should be watching and also it influenced what people should be making at that time. So, this was a time when uh, see according to those standards, the standards of those times, Bonnie and Clyde was an extremely violent film and along with another film point blank, okay, it also uh, paved the way for a very different kind of cinema. It was also the time we have already talked about blow up and the battle of Algiers and it proved that European innovation was influencing American new wave, American cinema. Here is a clipping, the final scene from Bonnie and Clyde, please watch it and uh, it will substantiate what I have been telling you. A movie that preceded Bonnie and Clyde, but is still extremely avant-garde and very experimental in nature was Richard Lester's 1964 movie, A Hard Day's Night. Now, A Hard Day's Night is a genre defying work. Um, it is called often, uh, um, it is often called as Citizen Kane of jukebox movies, you know the musical films. The Beatles, it stars the Beatles as Beatles. And they were already a publicity phenomenon, but through this film, audience got to know the boys behind the band. The film is extremely irreverent, again, pretty anti authoritarian in its tone. It is joyous and very original. It is one of the earliest mainstream work with a documentary look with handheld cameras and black and white photography 
it also employed quick cutting with the boys giving interviews on the run and with intercuts of dialogues. Now, other name that you should be familiar with is uh, BBS, which is a shortened form for three filmmakers who changed or who revolutionized the way American cinema was made in the late 60s and the early 70s at the forefront of the entire new wave culture, new wave cinema. Bert Schneider, Bob Raffelson and Steven Blauner. Now, BBS was their company that enabled directors to make the kinds of film they wanted to and in doing so, they produced pictures which were seminal or influential uh, on the cinematic renaissance that followed. Most filmmakers were now writers, directors and occasionally actors also such as Warren Beatty, Dennis Hopper, Peter Fonda, Woody Allen and Jack Nicholson. Bert Schneider produced Easy Rider, the film that broke every rule in the book and was the first new real uh, or the first real new Hollywood picture. Raffelson and Schneider wanted the style of a, you know a television series to reflect avant-garde film techniques such as improvisation, quick cuts, jump cuts, breaking the fourth wall and free flowing loose narratives. Uh, which was then pioneered by the European filmmakers. Here is a clipping from Easy Rider. Please watch it. Now, Easy Rider's success led to another interesting film. Alice's Restaurant, which is 1969 uh, short film. It is directed by Arthur Penn and the film was released soon after the Woodstock festival. It is an adaptation of a folk song, Alice's Restaurant, which is a 23 minute song by Arlo Guthrie. It starred musician Arlo Guthrie as himself and in the film he rebels against everything that is perceived as traditional. The plot concerns a road trip taken by Guthrie, making new friends, meeting old friends, hitchhiking, playing his guitar and making a case for a life in a commune. BBS also produced a TV show with the group uh, of the musicians, The Monkeys, where each episode would uh, contain at least one musical romp, which might have nothing to do with the storyline. The impulse was to make a Hard Day's Night as a TV show. BBC went on, uh, sorry, BBS went on to produce some of the most interesting works of that period, starting with Easy Rider and then Head Drive, he said, Five Easy Pieces, The King of Marvin Gardens, films which went on to redefine Hollywood. In Easy Rider, the writers and actors Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda used the motif of journey to affirm the alternative kind of lifestyle to expose the stifling repression of conservative Midwest America. It is a road a movie, it is a road trip uh, taken by two hippies and we have already seen the literary and cultural influence on these, uh, on this kind of period and it is very uh, apparent on Easy Rider. So, um, uh, literature like um, On the Road by Kerouac, I have already told you about and also Allen Ginsberg's Howl. So, this is what the writers and the directors portrayed on screen, which was already said to a large extent, to a great extent by the literateurs of the period. So, uh, the plot is the, these two uh, protagonists as played by Peter Fonda and Don Dennis Hopper, they buy cocaine in Mexico, hide it in their motorbikes, smuggle it across the border and head towards New Orleans for Mardi Gras festival, which is uh, also known as the carnival. Now, the hippies adventures including crossing the Colorado bridge, crossing the desert of Monument Valley, reaching New Orleans and getting killed while leaving New Orleans, it is all captured through uh, the strains of the then very popular rock and pop music and also through using very innovative kinds of techniques, cinematic techniques. Easy Rider 
marks the beginning of new Hollywood and like Bonnie and Clyde, it celebrates rebels, outlaws and mis misfits of the American society. One of the most memorable lines is from Captain America or White as played by Peter Fonda who says, we blew it and it was read by many as the, 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 as the death of the American dream. What is blown? The American dream, the American promise. So, uh, what was uh, its legacy? The film gave voice to those filmmakers who reacted against the standard and the banal fare and experimented with a new style, new actors and new materials. Five Easy Pieces 1970 movie is again a seminal film directed by Bob Raffelson and also produced by BBS. Mm, B, uh, here you have Bob Dupia as played by Jack Nicholson who is, uh, who belongs to a distinguished uh, music family where his father and brother, they are concert pianists. The story begins in a small Californian town where Jack is living in with his girlfriend Riot who is a waitress and Jack works in an oil field, spends his evenings in the bowling alley and watches TV. So, all working class pleasures, okay, although he comes from a very distinguished family. But the desire to, uh, you know, it is uh, turning the American dream on its head. American dr uh, dream is all about the desire to come up in life, the uh, notion of upward mobility. But here we look at people who at the protagonist who actually works his way down the social ladder. So, he takes up a waitress as a girlfriend, spends time in bowling alley and watches television, drinks beer. So, all very non-elitist pursuits. When Raid gets pregnant, uh, Jack has mixed feelings about their relationship. Meaning, uh, meanwhile, he learns that his father has suffered a stroke and then Bobby takes his girlfriend along for a road trip to home. They travel through California, Oregon and Washington and here is one of the most famous scenes, a very much beloved scenes from Five Easy Pieces, the diner scene. Please uh, look at the link, watch the movie, uh, watch the scene and we will talk about it. Now, this is a scene um, why I am interested in is because um, consider the way Jack Nicholson's Bobby Dupia, he questions the rules. Now, the rules may be very simple, he is just talking about what he wants to have at a restaurant, but and he challenges the waitress who is extremely rigid in her views. She would not give him an inch, she would not budge an inch, but the point is not just about having the kind of breakfast you want, but actually questioning the establishment, questioning the rules. Why do we need to follow what is written in black and white all the time? Why can't we be a little more spontaneous and uh, anti-establishment once in a while? It may not, it may not necessarily hurt anyone. So, why not give in to the simple pleasures of life? That was at the heart of all of the particular period that we are talking about. So, we will continue with our discussion of new Hollywood cinema in our next class. Thank you.